Today, I'm speaking with Steve Jacana. Steve, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks and, for having me, Tim. This is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just going to give a quick bio. I don't know you too well, so I'm really looking forward to just getting to know you and uh, becoming your friend. But uh, you do amazing work, which we'll talk about shortly. But Steve and his family live up in Canada, uh, up, I say, compared to me, uh, down here in Georgia, but close to Windsor, Ontario. Uh, I'd love to hear, what, after I'm done giving your bio, I'd love to hear about Ontario. I don't know too much about it. Uh, they have two kids. He's an active member and a chapter ambassador of Humanist Canada, which we'll talk about later in the interview. He's also an ambassador program director for Recovering from Religion. He has a Bachelor of Arts in History and a Bachelor of Education in primary and junior grades. He was raised as a free thinker and has been married to a Christian for 10 years. Steve and his wife believe in the importance of bridging the gap between believers and non-believers, and their two young children are being raised in an interfaith household, but are free to choose their own path. So with that in mind, if you could uh, tell us more about yourself and, and maybe a few hobbies in there as well. Well, it's funny because that makes me sound important, but I'm just like a guy off the internet, so <laughs> that's kind of funny. Um, You're yeah, important to us. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, this that pretty much uh, wraps it all up. That's uh, what I've been doing, what I'm what I'm up to, and I've been married to a Christian for ten years. It's uh, it's been a difficult journey, but I've uh, been able to uh, manage it, and I can explain that in a little bit as well. Um, one big thing that uh, people may not know about me is I'm a huge Limp Biscuit fan, um, which is is I get you know flack for it all the time because uh, you know '90s new metal. Um, it's just it's something I've always been into. It's my favorite band. And I saw them uh, 2014, 2021, and then I'm going to see them again this year in July. Mm, that's awesome. That's awesome. And what ages are your kids? Uh, they're six and four. Okay. Very cool. Almost very seven, cool. six, almost seven. So we're, we're around the same ages for our kids. So you have a, bit, you have a busy household too. Is, uh, well, you're just busier. You have four. I only have two. So yeah it definitely it, well it's some it seems like it just eventually when you get to a certain point it's like it's all just it's chaos it doesn't really like i think even adding one or two more at this point if we could, had done that wouldn't make too much of a difference it's just chaos yeah but, i hear that <laughs> and in terms of um your your story i'm just going to give a brief uh introduction for for what we're about to go into with the actual interview you did not grow up as a christian pretty much you were exposed to christianity in some senses i'm guessing but you didn't actually grow up believing it or being pressure to believe it. So this is going to be a little bit of a different interview. We're going to focus a little bit on your story for, for forever long. We go for that, but then we're going to switch it uh, you know, midway to talk a little bit more about um, both the idea of an interfaith household, as well as what you do with Humanist Canada. So just to give everyone a brief uh, preface for what we're about to do. But with that, that being said, I would still have to hear your story. I'm sure I've got some questions about what it's like growing up as a free thinker in a free thinking household. So if you could tell us about yourself and just how your uh, journey evolved. Yeah, thanks. It's a long story, um, so I'm going to try and give you the the Coles notes. Um, but I I was nominally Christian, I guess you can say, because I was baptized Anglican. Um, so my parents, yeah, they they went to the Anglican church, um, but not very often. They both were kind of free thinkers. Didn't really. They were kind of like the Christers, where they would go on on Christmas and Easter, I guess, or the what they call them. So um, they had us baptized, uh, me and my sister, and then. Uh, uh, when I was about three years old, my my parents divorced, and we went to live with my mom, with my grandparents, her parents, um, and my dad kind of had a lot of issues and and uh, ended up going down a dark path um, with drugs and stuff like that, and ended up um, kind of coming to Christ at some point uh, when I was about five or six years old. I was still going to see him on weekends and and things like that. Um, and when I would go see him, he would take us to church. So I was getting like a low level introduction to Christianity. So I was kind of like learning, you know, the basic stories from Sunday school and, and drinking wine, like actual wine from the cups because it was uh, the Anglican church and they're all about like kids can drink wine and whatever. So yeah. anyway, um, so I was, uh, doing that. And then, um, at the same time, my mom was, non-religious so she was just kind of imparting her wisdom on us um teaching us you know like treat others the way they want to be treated um and that just kind of took um took my uh interest like i just was like oh yeah i don't really need to um, believe in something else i don't need to go to church to be a good person um and then so my grandfather uh my mother's father was a, a freemason um and wow. Yeah, I had a lot of good experiences of remembering him saying, oh, I went to a meeting. It was so great. You know, I get to see everyone shake their hand, talk to them about cool stuff. And I always thought, like, that'd be a cool thing to do when I get to be of age. 
Um, and then I think I was about six or seven, maybe maybe eight, when he passed away. Um, he actually had a stroke in our home, and I could hear his head hit the the um, the tub. And my grandma, who we called Nana, she was like, "My baby, my baby, my baby." And I'm like, "What is going on?" Like I, I had this weird dream that there was a skunk in the house for some reason, and she was calling the skunk her baby. It was really strange. Um, and uh, and I and I remember opening the door and seeing him laying on the ground, and it was just a huge shock. Um, and then he was in the hospital. And then my mom never took us to the hospital to see him because he was in such a poor condition. She didn't want us to see him that way. So I had all these weird thoughts of like, where is he now? Where did he go? What what's going on? Right? Like I didn't really understand the whole death thing. Um, and um, after that, I was like, I, I kind of want to be a Freemason because he was a Freemason. And that's kind of a way I can continue on his legacy. And, and you know, my grandmother was always supportive of that as well. Um, so let's fast forward quite a few years. Can I ask uh, real quick, just for anyone yeah. that doesn't know, and, and myself in part, what exactly would a Freemason mean? Like, what does that mean to become one of those people? Yeah. So I can explain that, uh, in the next part here, but basically, um, a Freemason, I, I don't, are you familiar at all with the Masonic Lodge or? I'm familiar with it more on the esoteric sacred geometry, numerology side, okay. not as much on the whole, let's get together and, and just have, you know, a social club kind of thing. I'm more familiar so, with the, the ancient side of it. Right. Okay. So that's what I thought too, when he'd say like, you know, let's um, go and hang out and, and whatever. It kind of, there is a bit of that, but it's more after the ceremonies, the ceremonies themselves um, are actually quite religious. They're all based on biblical texts. Right. So, um, and, and I can explain that like when I, when I get into, I'll just get into the next part, um, which is, um, yeah, sounds good. So throughout my childhood, I actually went through a period where I was like, maybe there is a God. Maybe if I pray to this God, I'll be able to get a girl to like me, you know, like let this girl like me and I'll believe in you type thing. And just never really worked. Nice. At one point I went like, I, I lived by the woods. I was, I grew up in Muskoka, which is about five hours North of here. Um, North west northeast northeast of here um and so there was a lot of woods around me and, I, and i'd go out and explore in the woods and i would say like you know maybe there's spirits in the trees maybe there's spirits in the animals maybe there's maybe zeus is here because my family is kind of greek uh, i'm greek and scottish so i'm like maybe the greek mythology is correct maybe you know zeus if you're there show me by a lightning bolt or something and nothing ever happened right so this kind of went on through my entire life um i would it was never off the table. I would talk to my mom about religion all the time. I would ask her about Jesus. I would ask her about all these things. Um, and we also had people in our in our school that were multi-faith. So we had people that were Hindu. We had people that were um, uh, Muslim. And I would ask them all the time because it was a super interesting topic to me. I'd say, what is it that you believe in why? Um, and nobody could give me a satisfactory answer to the why, but I was super interested in the the belief. Um, so fast forward to, I get to be 21 and I'm like, finally, I can join the Masonic Lodge. This is awesome. So I put in my application and they called my references and all this stuff like that. And, and they say, we need to meet with you in person to discuss, you know, how you can get in. And what they do is this, they have, okay, well, I'll explain that in a second. So we, we, we get in there it was like a little bit of a meeting and I meet with a couple of guys and they say, you know, um, you need to profess belief in a, in a higher power. So I'm thinking like, okay, what could I, what could I say? I'm like, I guess I can say I believe in a higher power because there's got to be something out there that's pow more powerful than me. Maybe it's a, a person, maybe it's an animal, maybe it's something, it's some, maybe, you know, energy. I don't know. So I'm just going to say, sure. I'll just say yes. Um, because they're like, oh, it doesn't have to be the God of the Bible. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. I can say something's a higher power. Um, you know, when you drive under um, telephone wires, I guess that's a higher power. It's higher than you. Right. So anyway, I, I don't know. I'm just trying to find a way to reconcile this. So I'm like, sure. And they're saying, they're saying, you know, okay, you need to be a good person. You need to, you know, be um, volunteering in the community. And at the time I was volunteering at the hospital as an auxiliary staff, um, which, you know, you had to get 40 hours of, of community service in high school. Uh, and I continued that beyond high school. I was still doing uh, community service with them uh, where I would go to patients rooms, bring in water. Like I would just fill water bottles up, take the big tray upstairs and, go and talk to the people in the rooms, which was also kind of neat too, because I would go into rooms where there'd be crosses on the wall and everything. And, and um, I feel like where, where I would go into a room where I'd see different imagery like that, I would treat the people differently, which was kind of strange. 
but I would be more soft spoken. I would be, you know, a little bit more polite with the people that had crosses and stuff, which is kind of just a weird, like psychological thing, I guess, you know, from the the culture. Like um, you res maybe respected them more. Yeah, it was kind of weird that way, right? Like it's kind of like in our society, it's like you're you're taught that, um, you know, if you're a Christian, you're a good person or something, right? So I've had people come up to me and they're like, "I'm a Christian." And that's how they introduce themselves. And I'm like cool story, bro. That doesn't tell me anything about, you know, what kind of person you are or who you are. Cause I know Christians that are, you know, not the nicest people. I also know atheists that are not the nicest people. So it doesn't really matter what your beliefs are. Um, what matters is how you treat people and, and, and what your, your, um, your worldview is when it comes to, you know, thinking about others. But, um, so, so I ended up getting through the interview, um, through the Masonic Lodge. Uh, the, contacted all my references and everything and then what they do is they do this this ceremony where they get together and they put um they vote by putting a white ball or a black ball in the box if you get one black ball you're out so i guess everyone gave me a white ball so that's a good thing um and you have to have a sponsor so you have to have someone that you know is a ma mason two sponsors actually that can vouch for your character uh, so I, I used one that was a friend of my grandfather and then i also used one who was my boss uh, at the time when I was younger, uh, uh, at Santa's village, um, which is, you know, like a theme park for, for kids. And I always tell the kids, cause when I got my teaching degree, I, I had to do a couple placements. And, um, when the kids would act up, I'd be like, you be careful. I used to work for Santa. I, I still have his number, <laughs> but, uh, but then I would quick, just say, oh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So quick um, question on the, on the, the vote thing. And this is just, I'm just curious, really, this is not important, but, um, number one, can you like re attempt if you get blackballed once can you try again a month later or is it like that's it you can't ever come back that's a good question i think it's like you can't come back okay i think it's like it's on record like you are blackballed um, and do they ever like re-vote like if somebody's kind of turning into a jer jerk do they kind of do like a you know how people like to vote yeah. of confidence in in a leader like let's do a vote of confidence even though he's been with us for six months let's let's redo our marbles and see if we right. get all whites again yeah that's a really good question i don't know i i um yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if I stuck I stuck around long enough to find out, um, but I'll explain that in a second too. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, yeah, so so I got in, and my very first um, meeting, I was completely like blown away. So you have to be in a suit. You have to go in in a suit. So you have to like own a suit or rent one every time. But I mean, you're going I think once a month. Um, so they take you into this building. You go upstairs, and you know they, they put a blindfold on you or put like you know whatever they walk you through the ceremony which kind of represents a story from the bible and then they they kind of kneel you down in front of this altar and then they say who do you put your trust in and someone whispers in your ear god so i had to say the word god even though i didn't believe in a god so i'm like right away i'm like this is very weird because they told me you don't need to believe in the God of the Bible or, or whatever God. You just have to believe in something higher. So I assume like if they said, what do you put your trust in? If they said like the universe or they said, you know, whatever, a higher power, I could have said that. No problem. But I kind of stumbled over. I was like, G -g 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 God, because <laughs> I'm like, what am I saying here? Right. Um, so I went through this whole ceremony. They're like, oh, right, you are and believing this and whatever and saying all the stuff. And then they kind of went through this whole thing and then they give you your apron and your uh, basically an apprentice at that point um and then afterwards is the fellow so basically after they do this weird ceremony you go into this room and you eat sandwiches that the women prepared for you it's a very like traditional like the men are doing this cool thing the women are making the sandwiches for the men which was just to me kind of strange um you know because it's not like the the dark ages um do the women have their own um yeah yeah kind of ceremonies like and stuff called the order of the eastern star and they okay. basically just exist to like please the men or something i don't know it's it's very weird so i did continue uh for a few years um i kind of wanted to see it to its end you know the third degree is they call master mason um so you go through your apprenticeship you go through tradesman i think it's called and then master mason um so i kind of wanted to see you know is there something to this or am i am i right that this is just kind of a weird like boys club thing um and uh, during that time, uh, I met my wife. So I was kind of going through like a, a state of exploration, I guess you'd say, um, when it comes to faith. Not that I really believed it, but maybe I thought like, maybe there's something to this. Because, you know, at the same time, meeting my wife, who is a Christian, 
and she was uh, going to the United Church. Um, and that's where like kind of their home base was for the Masonic Lodge was the United Church. So I went to a party for um, a friend of mine. Uh, her boyfriend was having a birthday party and she had invited this girl who was on a placement at the hospital where she was working. Um, and so I was down in the basement and I saw this girl walk down the stairs and I'm like, oh, wow, she's pretty cute. Like, I want to be able to talk to her, but I'm kind of shy. So I don't know what to do. So I kind of was watching her from afar and I didn't really approach or anything. Um, and then they started singing happy birthday and they had this ice cream cake. So they were singing happy birthday and whatever to this guy. Um, by the end of the song, I had grabbed a piece of the ice cream cake and I smushed it on the side of her face. And I didn't say one word to her. I just looked at her and she just looked at me. And then I said, I'm sorry. And I started pulling it off of her face and eating it. <laughs> and she was just like looking at me like in complete shock. Like, what are you doing? And I'm like, you know, so I ended up kind of helping her clean it off. And then I kind of went upstairs and walked away. And then I turned around and she was right there. And we just started talking and we just hit it off. We had a lot of co in common with family and um, that type of thing. And, and and everyone kind of went to the the bar afterwards because there's this one bar in town. This is in Muskoka. Um, and we all just kind of hung out and had a great time. And we chatted about a lot of things. And so sort of at the end of the night, I'm like driving people home because I was usually the the DD. Um, didn't really drink too much, um, mostly because of like my, my father's past. I didn't really want to get... Um, involved in that I actually didn't start probably drinking until I was an adult like after I met Cindy and um had kids <laughs> and you know sometimes they can drive you to drink I also didn't have the gray hair until the kids so you know, wonderful gifts from them you know, um, yeah <laughs> so um I was driving everyone home and, and I made sure she was the last one to be dropped off and I said to her I had a really good time with you and she said yeah me too and I said um I'd like to see you again she goes yeah me too I said okay uh, can I have your number then? So she gave me your number and, you know, you're supposed to do the cool guy thing and wait like a while. I think I texted her the next morning at like nine or 10 in the morning or something like that. And I asked if she wanted to hang out and she's like, Oh, I'm going skiing with friends. So I'm like, okay. So I, I just assumed that she was blowing me off and that I'd never see her again. And then she texted me that night and said, well, I'm free Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then we ended up hanging out every single one of those nights. And I was pretty impressive too. Cause on the, nice. the Friday there was a, a winter carnival. And they had helicopter rides. So we were able, I was able to, you know, pay a small fee, get us up in a helicopter. And she thought that was pretty cool. But now it's like, I kind of outdid myself. Cause now it's like, when we go on a date, she's like, why, why aren't we having a helicopter? You know? <laughs> you set so the bar goal, too high. Yeah. Yeah. My goal eventually is to, to, you know, take her in a helicopter over Niagara Falls or something. But uh, that'd be cool. Yeah. So at the time uh, when I met her, religion didn't really come up. It wasn't really like a thing. Um, but I kind of knew that she was going to United Church, so I would just go along with her because that's, I was trying to, you know, woo her, impress her, whatever. It was just kind of like, let's, let's go together. Sure. Maybe there's something to this. Cause like, like I said, I was with the Masonic Lodge and they're talking about God and the church is talking about God. Maybe there's something to the, you know, about it. So, you know, I'd go with her once in a while and we got to the point where everything got really serious and we, and I proposed to her, um, and then we were to be married. I was, I was working for a, just a landscaping company. Um, so I had plans to go to teacher's college uh, after the summer um, because I wanted to better my situation. I wanted to get a job, you know, in teaching and stuff like that. Um, so we got married in the summer of 2014. And the wedding itself was, it was like the best day of my life. It was really, it was fantastic. We had a really great time, really good friends, really good food, really good everything. Um, it was, it was kind of inherently religious, but it wasn't like, to me at the time, I didn't really care. Um, I didn't really mention this, but I was more of an apatheist. So I didn't really believe in God or anything, but I didn't really care about that. It just didn't, wasn't a big thing for me. Yeah. Um, wasn't a big thing in my life. Um, so, you know, it was, uh, you know, our, our vows had to say God in them. Um, you know, the ceremony itself was in her family's church. Um, and, it was down here in the Windsor area. So we came all the way here to, to get married. We went all the way back home, which was, you know, five hours away. And we were living there for a little bit longer until I finished uh, teacher's college and everything. And then after we finished teacher's college, I'm like, do you want to move down to like the Windsor area where like your family is? 
um, because my mom uh, was was dating a man who now she's married to. Um, so she had her own life going. Um, her family was down there. And it's like, you know what, let's just move closer to your family because, you know, the family and everything is really important to them. And let's do that. So, and I'm like, my mom's willing to travel because she's just, you know, by herself and with, you know, this other guy. So anyway, uh, we moved down and we were looking for a place to live. So we ended up living with her parents. And while we were living there, again, I was just going to church with them because it was just the thing to do. So we would go to church like every Sunday. And one thing I forgot to mention is during our wedding, this is kind of when I started to get um, a little bit um, uncomfortable because during the wedding, um, her parents during their speech said, we're so glad that she met a man that believes the exact same thing she does. And I love her parents. Her parents are amazing. I mean, sadly, we lost my father-in-law um, earlier in 20, 2023. So it's been a really big um, hole in our heart and hole in our family um, this whole year. And his birthday was actually on Christmas Day. So it was a really, really somber um, occasion this Christmas. It's just been brutal. Um, mm. Really, really caring individual. He's you know one of the best people I've ever met in my life. Um, and her mom is just amazing too. Like she's just such a caring woman. Um, mm. but, but the thing is, is with, with that is like, I felt like a wolf in sheep's clothing when they said that, because I didn't believe it. So for them right. to say, Oh, I'm so glad that she met this guy that it's like, okay, so they're so glad that she met somebody that's not me. Like, I don't, you know, to me, that's what it felt like. Can um, I ask with, with the courtship process for, for just, just exposing my background, the, mm. the, the parents, or at least the dads are usually very involved at some point at least at the very beginning in like interviewing a potential uh, match potential suitor was there ever a time where you all were kind of like like let's have a heart to heart here are we on the same page you know family wise with our worldviews we're not or did was it just an assumption that if if you're a guy that goes to church every sunday that you you must be on the right track yeah, I, I'm not too sure. The only thing that like her parents have always been very, very open and they're very open to everybody. I mean, they have friends that are non-believers. They have friends that are, you know, different faiths and stuff like that, too. So I don't think that was a big deal for them. Uh, I just know that for them personally, um, Christianity was a big part of their lives. And it was a big part of how they met and how they um, their courtship happened and all that stuff was, I think, at Bible camp or or something like that. So like they, they that was a big background for them and i think that just the yeah me willing to go to the like church and and do like the religious wedding and stuff like that i think was enough for them um but then maybe there was a little bit more you know with them saying that they they're so glad that she met somebody that believes the same um but the thing is is that slowly after that i started to pull back um which i'll get into in the next part here but i was starting to pull back from things like when they'd ask me to go to church i'd be like no i don't think i'm gonna go this time um because it did get to a point where at night i was crying i was crying to myself because i'm like I, I i can't i can't pretend to be who they want me to be and it's just not me and i told my wife i said i just can't go to church anymore she's like that's mm -hmm. okay that's okay you know she was very understanding about it and um can i ask but, just a context question with all your exposure here and there to religion and to Christianity, was there ever a time where it really did capture your imagination enough that you thought, you know, maybe I should really seriously consider that this might be tr ultimate truth, ultimate reality? Or was it always like a just this is an interesting thing, but I'm it it doesn't doesn't personally affect me? Like, was there a time where it ever really got you and, and or at least got, got you close to the point where you were thinking I, I, I might actually be in, in, you know, from a Christian claims perspective, I might actually be in danger here. Or I might have a sin issue that is not very much unresolved. Did it ever get that close for you? No, no. Um, okay. No, I never felt that. Um, the only thing I ever like, I was trying to get I was trying to give it a fair shot. So I was trying to open my mind to the point of like, okay, maybe this is a possibility. But the things I was hearing, it just didn't make sense to me. Um, and then I'm thinking like, okay, well, just because it doesn't make sense to me, maybe, you know, maybe my brain is just too small or maybe I don't understand it. But like, I can't, I can't force myself to choose something, um, to like choose to believe in something because you're either convinced or you're not. Um, and I never found anything to be convincing. Um, hmm. 
especially because I was exposed to so many different religions and I'm like, oh, okay, this is the same as this other thing. Uh, they just changed the wording a bit or they, you know, whatever. The stories are very similar. Um, sometimes the stories are completely not similar, but, you know, a lot of the same kind of mythology and stories, that type of thing. Just to me, it's always been stories, always been stories. Well, can I ask about that? If if you were feeling that way, mm -hmm. um, that, that these were just stories and mythologies, was there ever a, just a, a, I don't know exactly how to phrase it without sounding condescending to the Christians in your life at that time, but just like, like, why can't you all see that this doesn't look real? Like why, like I know you said that maybe you just needed to learn more or, or be smarter that you would see it differently. But at the same time, if you could recognize that it did seem like mythology, was there any sense of like these people, like, why are they so gullible? Like, why are they believing this when it's clearly not, there's nothing to this, but fluff at the end. Yeah. Did it, so was it hard to deal right? with that? That's the next part of my story when it became an angry atheist. I keep jumping ahead of you. I need to just let you go. <laughs> no, it's all good. Yeah, no, that's good. It's good. It's, you know, it's good questions because it's leading into the next thing for sure. Um, yeah, no, I became an angry atheist after that. So like I said, I was crying myself to sleep. I'm like, this is like, I, I, I can't deal with this. I can't get pressured all the time to go and, and do this stuff. We got a call one time from the minister and he's like, hey, just wanted to let you know that we're signing you guys up to light the Christ candle this coming Sunday and we're going to be passing the plate around and all that. And I said, said to my wife, I'm like, I can't go anymore. I just can't, I can't do this. I can't pretend to be something I'm not. And that's kind of when I really broke the news to her that I don't believe it. And I never really have. And I said, you know, I tried to give it a fair shot. I just, there's nothing I can do to, to convince myself. I'm just not convinced. And I started to get angry and I think it was more at myself for duping people. Um, so I was more angry at myself, but I was lashing out at others. So I was really lashing out at her and her beliefs and saying like, you are so smart in other ways. Like, how can you be so stupid when it comes to this? Just like you'd said earlier. Right. And, and it really hurt her really badly. Like there was, there was times where she crying herself to sleep. I was crying. Like we were just at, at each other's throats about it. Just like, and, and she said, I cannot talk to you about religion ever again. That's just not a thing. We're not going to talk about it. We're just, we're, we're done talking about it. And was I'm it, like, was it cu cultural, mostly cultural for her? Was she like truly thoroughly believing that Jesus was her Lord and savior? Um, I know that at, um, at camp when she was younger, she accepted Christ into her heart as her Lord and savior. Um, I don't know because like I said, she doesn't want to discuss religion. So I don't know what it is that actually is convincing her of it. Um, I'm, I'm convinced that she's convinced. But I mean, I have to take her word for it. So I, I don't know. Um, but I mean, I that's when later on, when it comes to the mutual respect, um, I, I, I respect her decision. I respect her 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 choice, if you want to call it that, or, or her um, um, being convinced. Mm -hmm. um, Did you sense so, that any of her angst was not just that you're differing paths, but over concern for your eternal state, your mm -hmm. eternal salvation? Yeah, so that that became a, a thing as well, um, where she was saying like, you know, she just didn't want me to go to hell and and all this stuff, and and I'm like, well, I don't really believe in hell, um, but I understand the fear, right? I understand the um, the indoctrination to to be brought up to to believe in a place that is eternal torture. But I even said things to her like, you know, would an all loving God send someone somewhere where it's like that, or would they have even created something like that in the first place? Um, and you know, her answer is, I don't know, which is a really good answer. That's a really honest answer. I think that's the most honest answer anyone could give. Cause that's what I say to everything, like not everything, but you know, there's, there's a lot of things where we don't know. And that's the most honest answer. And I feel like the schools do a disservice to kids when they say, if you don't know the answer, then you're wrong. I think that's, I think that's not a, not a very good thing to say to the kids because, mm. you know, we can find out the answer if there is an answer, maybe there isn't an answer, or maybe there is one that we just don't know yet. Right. So there's a lot of things that are they're out in the open um sure and, and that's the thing is is you know I, I i brought a lot of questions to her and sh her answer for a lot of it was i don't know and and you know she decided or she is still convinced that that is uh that it's true and and that's totally cool um it's not my job to um convince or deconvince anyone of of 
of their beliefs, that's totally up to them. I mean, you really can't, the only person that can change their mind is, is the person, right? So um, when I was going through that phase, maybe there was a, a point where I was really trying to get her to deconvert just because um, to me, I'm like, the world would only make sense if everyone believes what I believe, right? Uh, and so I went through that period and during the angry phase as well. Um, so this is when my life changed completely. So I was like, great, I'm, I'm ruining my marriage. There's like, I'm ruining it. Um, we're, we're going to be in a really bad place for having children and everything. Like I just, it's, it's going to be horrible. Um, and then that's when I discovered. So I, I started doing some research online and I found, um, uh, Anthony Magna Bosco, who does street epistemology, um, based on a book by Peter Bogosian, Dr. Peter Bogosian, um, which is called a manual for creating atheists, but it was, it was a misnomer. They, he didn't really want it to be called that. That's just kind of what the publisher wanted it to be called. And he did a revised edition, which is called how to have impossible conversations. And I th feel like that's a better title. Um, so yeah. street epistemology for anyone who's not familiar is like a, a way to have um, conversations without raising someone's hackles. Uh, it's kind of using the Socratic questioning method. Um, so I started approaching my life from that perspective that, you know, I want to be genuinely curious and I want to know why people want to know what they're, why people um, believe things and, and, and stuff like that. So I started asking her questions as opposed to, you know, telling her what I think. Um, and that kind of, you know, soothed things down for a little bit. And in the meantime, I discovered um, my hero, my humanist hero, I always call him, um, Dale McGowan. Not sure if you're familiar with him, but he is an yeah. Author. He lives lives real close to me. Yeah, he's in Atlanta. So yeah, um, so yeah. Have you talked to him before? Yeah, he's he's on my list of people to interview. He's 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 not uh, on the interview circuit at the moment, but uh, he's on my list. As soon as he's back on the circuit, I'm going to get him. <laughs> awesome, cool, yeah, yeah. Um, so he's a good friend of mine now because of this whole situation. So I reached out to him and I said, I need help. <laughs> you know, I need help. This is this is this is your expertise. I've I've seen that you have these talks and these books. Um, and, and the biggest one right here is uh, In Faith and In Doubt. This is a huge book that helped me. Um, and, and it kind of explains uh, different situations in here too. So different different um, mixes of faiths. Um, and then also, you know, the positives and negative outcomes to some of the marriages that are represented in the book. He interviewed, um, I can't remember, it's like 100 couples or something like that. And then by the end, some of them had divorced some of them had um, stayed together. Some of them decided to have children. Some of them decided not to have children based on the, the situation. But um, he got a lot of information on the, in, in, in that book. And that definitely influenced how I approached um, my interfaith or multi-worldview, however you want to call it, marriage. Um, and I started showing her the respect that she deserved for her belief. Um, part of the thing is when I do this presentation coming up on interfaith marriage, one of the things I, I, I did was I asked her, what are the positives and what are the negatives to our relationship? And she said, one of the negatives is that she feels like, and I don't know if this is currently, I feel like she's, she's a little bit better now, but I feel she felt like, um, she wasn't able to be as good of a Christian as she wanted to be because she felt judged. So that's totally unfair. It's totally unfair for me to judge her. Um, based on what my worldview is, you know, what would, people have different thoughts. What would that have looked like to be a better Christian? Do you think, from her side? Um, I think what she's talking about is you know going to church more often, um, you know, sharing more about what she believes. Um, and that's one thing that Dale McGowan says is like you know you should wear your faith or your worldview proudly, while referring to the other person as well. Um, which gets into the parenting. So he also has the Parenting Beyond Belief book, which uh, he did sign for me which is awesome. It says to Steve, a great friend and parent beyond belief. So that's like, that made my life right there. Nice. Um, and then he's also got a practical guide called raising free thinkers, um, which is basically what my mom did by accident. So she followed the best practices of this book without even reading it. And before this book was even written, which is pretty insane. Um, and there's Just also mentioned since you're highlighting these books, I'll put all the links for all the, all the books that you're going to awesome. talk about in the interview. I'll put them all in the video so people can go, go pick them up if they want to. Yeah, for sure. And then I'm just reading this one now, but it's called Relax, It's Just God. And it's uh, by Wendy Thomas Russell. And it's a really good one. I, I didn't even know about this book until like maybe last month. Um, but it's it's awesome, too, because uh, it talks about how 
both her and her husband were non-religious, but the kids found out about God through school. So then it's like, well, how do you how do you approach that from you know being atheistic parents and not having any type of background in, in knowing what the faith is and how do you explain it and stuff like that? So it's a really good book. Um, all of those books are perfect for you know um, understanding um, the other side. Uh, and then also, you know, using the, the practical guides to to raise free thinkers. But the whole thing getting back to in faith and in doubt, um, there's there's so many different outcomes that it could be. And, and it kind of depends on which denomination and how extreme someone's views are and beliefs are. Right. Because, um, you know, someone could be very liberal with their beliefs and it's kind of like they're open to uh, other people, whereas, you know, they could be very conservative and they need to, you know, maintain their their doctrine and and not be unequally yoked as they say in the bible right so um luckily for me uh, my wife is very liberal she's very pro lgbtq she's like we we agree on like the majority of things just not the small things like the beginning of the universe so um that's uh it's 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 such a cool thing to hear that you all were able to have that you know, basically, like you said, the liberal version of Christianity that, I mean, I know we could, we could talk about all these aspects, all, you know, there's lots of little spider webs in my mind as to which, which path to take here. But that, that one issue, um, just to make, make a little note of this is, is so critical because I think that is such a watershed for so many of us. Cause if you do end up on the other end of it, where it's ultra conservative, ultra fundamentalist, if your spouse, for example, um, happens to be part of a group that, you know, even other Christians call a cult. If they actively make fun of homosexuals, um, you know, aggressively, they talk about putting them in prison and and, and so forth. When you have that, you know, we're going to take, basically, we're going to take over the world for Christ mentality. And there's just, there's no way that our worldview is not utterly correct and that Christ is truly king and he's about to become king literally of the United States um, or or of the world. When you when you have that fundamentalist background, it it is so divergent. And I love that you're pointing out that if if you if you've got any sense of the the liberalness of it, you've I think you do have a very good fighting chance because a lot of them are maybe even you know unless they grew up as liberal, but if they became a liberal from a conservative background, it it kind of shows they're asking the questions. They're saying maybe I do need to adjust my perspective a little bit at least, you know, not not that they couldn't revert to it, but. That's there's there's so much hope for for relationships like that I think and I've for I've sure. seen that and many many people have told me that very same thing and it what breaks my heart is obviously the the situations where it's it's the fundamentalist side where there's just there's no way to to talk about it and even the street epistemology which you brought up earlier even those kind of Socratic questions you can't ask them because there's they're so threatened by it and it's almost like by ask by virtue of asking those questions to them, even if you're not, to them, you're implying that there is a better way to see this whole thing. Otherwise, you wouldn't be asking the questions. And they they kind of see it as as leading. You're leading me to try to walk away from my faith. And it's it's um anyway, I just I, I love I love hearing the hopeful stories. It's um as people that follow my story know uh, my story is not on that trajectory. But I do I love I love hearing success stories. It it helps my heart a lot to know that there there are so many people that are going to make it through this and make it very successfully. For sure. And the thing is, too, is it's it's two sided. So it's not just me making that effort. So, you know, there's the spouse is also, you know, has to put in that effort, too, because she had to understand at some point that I'm an atheist. And, you know, what's the implications to that? Because she was raised to think that, you know, um, you're either with the devil or you're with God. And then if you're on the fence, the devil owns the fence. Right. Like that's something that she was kind of taught. So she kind of had to unlearn that in a way that, you know, she can reconcile with because she even told me that, you know, if she knew I was an atheist when we first got together, she probably wouldn't have even given me a second chance, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, that's totally understandable from her perspective. Um, there's I know a lot of atheists that say I would never I would never date a Christian. I would never date a religious person. Right. So, like, I can see it from both sides. Um to me, I was in a lucky situation where I didn't care one way or another about religion, and she wasn't that religious at the time. So you know, it was it was, it was kind of a mixing of of the the two best parts of our life, where we kind of you know were in a in a in a state where we could you know create that union. But 
Um, you know, we did go through some hardships and we're on the other side of that now. And looking back, it's like, wow, how did we make that work? But we did. Can I ask with, you mentioned earlier, the idea of like respecting each other's beliefs mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate, if you don't mind a little bit, but how, how did you walk the line of, of the more toxic parts of those beliefs? Because even for liberal Christians, there's still an implication that Christ's death and resurrection is a crucial part of the story, unless there's, I'm sure there's some liberal Christians that are more liberal that that's less important or the whole, I guess that maybe the, the, the ones that move, a, that still appreciate the death and resurrection, but they move away from atonement theory. But for, for the vast majority of people, there's something really special and important about Christ's violent death, that he had to die. He had to die violently. His blood had to be shed. And that's harking back to the Old Testament stories of the, 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 the goats and the sheep had to be violently sacrificed because the blood was required to atone for your sins and, and for, for God to be able to basically offer forgiveness by punishing something else in your place. All these things weave into the whole idea of, you know, that, that's, that whole system is necessary because you are a sinner, you know, going back to the Garden of Eden. In you know, in, in Romans, you're you're a child of Adam. You inherited sin nature. Even liberal Christians are going to weave some of that in, and yet that's very toxic and, in, in my opinion, psychologically abusive, especially to children, small children that don't have their autonomy in place yet. How did you walk that tightrope of being like, I respect your beliefs, but there's so much little abusiveness woven right into it. Yeah, sorry. I don't know if I misspoke when I said I respect beliefs. I don't know if I said that um, directly, but what I meant was I respect her as a person and okay. I respect. Yeah. So, so Matt Dillahunty always talks about this, that, you know, um, ideas don't, don't deserve respect, um, but the person deserves respect. So the human. Um, so I respect her autonomy and her, you know, human rights and dignity to believe what she wants um, I don't have to agree with the ideas that she has. Um, and like I said, so part of what Dale McGowan talks about in the book is that if you go through the tenets of your, of your, your spouse's church, um, you can go sit through and see like, do I agree with this? Do I agree with this? Do I, you know, do I disagree with this? And I found that for her church, I mean, it's the United Church of Canada. It's a very liberal. I agreed with the majority of them. The only thing I didn't really agree with was the God part. Um, but it, it it even says in her tenets that you can interpret the Bible the way you want to, which is wow. I feel it's very open. I mean, there's that's very the, open. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, the Unitarian Universalist Church. I'm not sure if you're aware of them. Yeah. Um, with recovering from religion, a lot of times if people call in and they say they're still religious, they want to belong to a church. We always usually push them towards Unitarian Universalist because they feel like Christ died for everybody. So regardless if you believe it or not, you're just the your sins have been paid for and you're going to heaven right so that um it doesn't matter what they think it's just that if you're going to be accepted there and that's what you want to do is you want to believe in uh, or you not want to but you do believe in a god or you want to belong to that type of community they're there for you because they'll you know they believe that you're getting into heaven regardless um mm. there's a lot of christians who believe that you get into heaven by your works and not necessarily by your belief so it just depends on who it is that you're speaking to um and I always say this, there's as many versions of Christianity as there are Christians. Um, there's as many versions of religion as there are religious people, because yeah. you literally can't sit two religious people down beside each other, even if they're in the same church and say to them, like, you know, did did Jesus, whatever, walk on water? One person could say yes, one person could say no. And you ask them another question. You know what I mean? So it's like it's like that annihilation game where you put your hand up and it says, OK, put your hand down if you think this, whatever. Right. There's there's going to be one person standing at the end and not, and not going to believe everything that is in the doctrine of the religion. Mm -hmm. um, there's something else I was going to mention uh, to go along with that. And now I, I've kind of drawn well, a, a gap well, here. Well, I did have a couple of questions. And do you mind my asking about this? This is a such a critical book. thing. Okay. I'm an open book. You can ask me anything. Nothing offends me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I always offer people, for anyone watching that wants to do an interview with me later, you know that any, any question I put on the table, if anyone wants to pass, we just edit that out. So no one ever has, uh, you know, has to, Put something out that they don't want in the in the world, but um, on the YouTube world. But the, the the question, first question, that comes to my mind is: Are your kids being told that they're sinners? No. So, okay. um, so we we had a discussion before we had kids um, that they're going to be free to choose. Not that you can choose your beliefs, but they're going to be free to to explore. Um, they can explore different worldviews. Um, 
one thing that again dale mcgowan i'm going to keep saying dale mcgowan's name because you know um this this all came from him originally that you know that i i learned this from and i just kind of use my own examples um but the one thing that we do is um the kids will come to me and say dad do you believe in god and i'll be like no i don't but mom does if you want to go talk to her about it and then you can come back to me and we can talk about other things or we can talk about you know what my beliefs are and and then she does the same so they'll go to her and go mom do you believe in god and she goes yes i do i really you know care deeply about god and and i believe jesus is real but dad doesn't so go talk to him and then we always have this this saying which came from dale mcgowan but basically it says um you know we'll love you no matter what we'll love you no matter what your beliefs are no matter what you however you turn out you know there's no wrong answer um so again, it, I'm really lucky. I'm in a really lucky state where my wife is willing to go along with me on this journey. Um, and and I kind of joke with her sometimes too, because I do these interfaith uh, talks and stuff like that. And, and Dale McGowan always talks about how his wife was a Christian at the time. And then she became an atheist and he kind of lost that, that trump card that like, you know, now he can't really go and talk about interfaith stuff. And I'm like, don't you do that to me. You know, to my wife, I'm like, don't you, don't you deconvert? I need you to stay a Christian so I can continue doing this stuff, right? So we joke about that stuff. It's 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 a fun, mm -hmm. it's good, and and the kids, you know, they. Uh, I'll show you a book, another book here. It's called El the Humanist, and it's a kids book. Yeah, and it talks about you know what a humanist is, and then talks about what uh, you know how to how to get along with other people of different faith groups, um, and talks about the the platinum rule in there, which. I'm biased, but I think it trumps all the other golden rules. And it basically is, you know, treat people the way they want to be treated because not everybody wants to be treated the same. Yeah. With, with the, the parenting, the co-parenting there and the, and the ways that you all talk about it. Do you, do you get the sense at all that you have to have your guard up, so to speak against childhood indoctrination, or do you feel like you all are in a safe spot where that's not a threat to your situation? The only way someone can be indoctrinated is if they're told that they have to believe in something and they can't question it. Right. My kids are free to question whatever it is they want. My kids have mm -hmm. the freedom. If I say to them, like, it's bedtime, they can say, why is it bedtime? And I'll say, well, look at the clock. It's 830 right now. If you don't go to sleep, you're going to be really tired in the morning and you're going to be grumpy, which is going to make me grumpy. Do you want that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's not I like because that. I said so. And it's, it's and I'll give you the reason for it. So. Mm -hmm. There's not really a fear for me of indoctrination. And to me, I always feel like the truth wins out in the end. So if there if Christianity is true, I mean, the truth will come out. If, you know, atheism is true, whatever, you know, if, if there is no God, that, that truth will come out in the end. It's it's not something that I need to fear. Uh, another thing Dale McGowan says is that, um, you know, people always ask him, you know, what if your kids become religious? And that's a huge question I get all the time, too. And, and it's like, what do you mean by religious? Is it going to be, you know, um, like the worst type of, you know, person like Kenneth Copeland or something like that? Or is it going to be just, you know, like a um, United Church of Canada or something, right? So it depends on what type of religion you mean. Like, is it going to be Mormon? You know, maybe there's going to be an issue because um, they won't be allowed to visit us if they're if we're not Mormon and stuff like that, right? But I believe that the the ethics and the morals that we're instilling in, in our kids is going to push them towards either a liberal religion or no religion at all. Yeah. Could I, could I just add one thought? And this is not as much a question, but I'd love your feedback on it. I know what you mean when you said that the truth will win in the end, but there is the, the cultural dynamic of ways where th culture shifts sometimes radically. And there isn't as much of a choice and the pressure is overwhelming. And sometimes that pressure can even get political or worse. Um, it would, when you look at the ways that there are very large groups of Christians who believe in Christian nationalism, dominion theology, they do want to take over the world for Christ, starting with America. And I'm sure there's some of them in Canada. I'm sure they're associated, but they're, they're very well-funded. They're large and growing. They're having large families. So they're expanding little soldiers for Christ. Um, they're stealthy. They know how to operate under the radar. And they would love to do what I would consider a second crusade against people. You know, people like like you and you and me could be in prison someday for 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 the fact that we're not Christians. Um, the truth could win out, but it could take a thousand years. Mm -hmm. Um, in the mid in the meantime, our kids are wrapped up in this stuff. Do you do you feel any angst over the fact that Christians 
have so much freedom and respect in this country to be so vocal and to have a, and a literal, true, hard shot at taking over the governments? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm in Canada, so I, I don't feel that as much. Um, I guess I'm considered in the Bible Belt because I'm kind of toward like I'm really close to Michigan. Um, but I don't feel that up here. I'm really I'm really sorry that you do feel that uh, where you're at. Um, what I meant when I say the truth will win out, I just mean on the small scale. So like when it comes to kids questioning, if kids are questioning things, um, they're going to ask the right questions because they're they're naturally curious. And if they don't get the, like an answer that says like, no, you're wrong for thinking this, and they continue to keep expanding their brain, the the you know the emphasis is on free thought, not atheism, not Christianity, not whatever. It's free thought, allowing them to just and that's a small f free thought, right? Mm -hmm. Allowing them to just question everything. Um, when it comes to the Christian nationalism that I see kind of coming in the United States, um, the one thing I always think is when you look at the population and you look at the numbers and the percentages of people that are religious versus non-religious, um, the number that you see there where it says non-religion or unaffiliated, I feel like is a lot higher than it actually shows on paper. And the reason for that is the last thing people want to do is when your friends and family think you're going to burn for hell in all of eternity, you're not going to be like, Oh, that's me. Right. You're not gonna put it on paper. So I feel like the, the number is closer to 50%, if not more. I mean, I don't know for sure. This is just me speculating. Um, so I feel like a lot of these things that we see where it's like a lot of extremism and stuff like that in, in religion is kind of the death throes. They're, they're really scared that free thought is kind of taking over the world because I've heard them say it like vocally. They'll say, you know, people are becoming atheists and people are doing this and whatever. They're scared. They're scared. And they're what they're trying to do is they're trying to change the world to to be the representation that they want however what's going to happen is it's going to push people away it's going to push people away harder and faster and i see it at recovering from religion we get people calling all the time saying this is all in my face all the time i don't want it i don't want anything to do with it and i'm done right um and also what happens is they have tons of kids but guess what's going to happen to the kids they have a phone in their pocket now they have like a you know connection to information that we never had when we were younger if their minister says something in the church, they're going to go, uh, oh, bullshit, right? So it's not like it, it seems like a big threat. But to me, from the outside looking in, I'm like, these are scared people. They're not going to last. It's not going to be, you know, they're not going to have the power that they think they do. Because, you know, even in in the I've seen this and I'm not sure what they call it. They call it down there. But the house, they've had like invocations that are not even religious invocations anymore. They've had, you know, President Barack Obama saying, you know, speaking for the non-believers as well. So, you know, the 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 culture is shifting and it's actually shifting in a positive direction. And that makes people scared and then people will lash out. But, the you know, usually when they say the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Right. So you, you those people are the ones that are getting all the information, like all the media is going to be focusing on them. Um, and everybody else that's just wanting to live their lives and be happy or not being in the news. I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. I I definitely feel um on the side of it where my my I see red flags a lot and I see a lot of people that are very concerned. I I, I agree with you. I I guess I focus a lot on cults and I I you know, I literally I'm in a spot where I literally see cult propaganda, you know, in my own home at this point. Um severe cult propaganda. And they really do, they are very well funded um, and they're very stealthy. And it's it's kind of scary to me what's coming. And I know that they are gearing up for some major pushes. I I, I feel like um, I'm in a spot that has the, the, the idea of being a militant atheist is not really an option to not be one because the, the alternative is extremely scary and is extremely, um, what's the word? I can't think of the word I'm thinking of, but they, they would just, they they want to be tyrants. They they want they want to literally tyrannize this country with their beliefs, and so I guess maybe maybe a, a question that would come to mind is for for your situation, since you all don't have that, but you still did have some level of, of discrepancy with your worldviews. When you started to have those conversations where you were starting to respect each other more, give each other more autonomy to be different and to raise your kids where where kids hear both sides of it equally, was there 
like how did you start the healing process of saying we're we're still clearly landing pretty differently maybe not as differently as the you know conservative christian uh atheist marriage would have but we're still landing pretty differently on some big topics here how did you start to build the just the emotional intimacy again where you like cuz I'm just imagining, you know, if, if someone, you know, you know, C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis talks in The Great Divorce, I think it is, or um, one of the other books about if you are eventually going to become, say, like if you're a Christian, you're eventually going to become glorified in heaven, then even though you right now, you look like a normal human, if we could see your true glorified state, you're going to look like an angel. You're going to just glow with the glory of God someday. You're going to be like Christ. Um, but if you're on the way to hell, then even though you look like a human today, you're going to become eventually overtaken by your selfishness and your sin. You're going to be kind of become a monster. And that's your truest form. Your truest form is either you're going to be almost angelic or you're going to become almost like a monster or a, de a demon. Knowing that that's how Christians would see it, you know, it's, it'd be really hard to, you know, make love to somebody thinking at the same time, like, I really love you and we're having a lot of fun, but you're going to burn someday. And and I'm quite okay with dancing with the Lord in glory and happiness and joy and no pain whatsoever while you are screaming in agony. That's hard to be, you know, emotionally, physically, psychologically intimate with that discrepancy. How did you start to weave through that and, and get to a point? I mean, it sounds like your marriage is pretty strong. Um, how did you get through that to be able to build build those bridges? I think I think uh, going back to how liberal she is with her with her beliefs, um, you know, because she's she's told me before that she's scared of me going to hell and burning and all that stuff. But like I said, she's more she she believes that you know you can kind of get to heaven through your works. Um, I think okay. that's it's kind of where she's taking things from. But like I said, we went when when we were in that really bad state, she told me she doesn't want to speak about religion. So I've kind of respected that as well. So like we haven't really talked a lot about religion like it does come up because of you know what i do for for this type of thing um and she's heard a couple of my my talks and, and things like that i was on the radio yesterday um the local radio nice. uh talking about yeah the humanist canada and what we do um and i mentioned her in it because i talked about the interfaith uh some well interfaith uh presentation i got coming up but i also have presented at interfaith symposiums with people with conflicting religions um which i have another one coming up on february 1st um but the whole thing is with with that is that she she thinks that you know if there is an all loving all powerful all caring god he's going to see me for who i am mm -hmm. and and the thing is is that i've done a lot of things to uh show how, like that i'm still a good person that my i get my morals from you know evolution basically you know it's uh, it's uh changes in evolutionary traits um show us that you know, we we needed to work together to be able to get to where we are today. So morality came from passing on those genes of working together because the people that didn't work together probably died out before they were able to have children. So the majority of people that are, you know, passing on those genes, you know, over a, a long period of time, the 250,000 to 300,000 years, whatever it is that humanity has existed, um, all those, those changes in allele frequency um, within the DNA, have you know given us that morality um so she kind of sees that from you know she does she is scientifically minded she went to school for for science um so she sees how that works and she sees that i'm a good person and i feel like again i'm very lucky i'm very privileged to be in a position where um she sees me in that way and i see her in the way that i see her we're, we're very privileged and very very lucky mm. do you ever get asked to give a word of advice or counsel to a couple that's considering getting married where they have different faiths. And um, if you, whether you have or not, like how, how would you approach a conversation like that? And what, what questions would you ask them? Like if they're, if they're, you're not just being nosy, but like they really want your input, like, you know, Hey, we really want a good marriage. You've got a good marriage. We want a good marriage too. You're in a faith. We're in a faith. Can you give us your two cents? Like what kind of questions would you ask or, or encourage them to think through to say, this this has a really good chance of working if the answer is clean this way versus you know you're you're going to be in hot water soon if you if your answers go that way right um so it's funny that you mentioned this because i am in the training to become an officiant a humanist officiant so i'll be able to conduct weddings and nice. thing yeah so that's that's going to be something that i've got coming up um 
starting in January, well, the end of January till like the middle of March, I'm going to be doing the training for that. So um, basically, if someone's coming to me and asking that, then they are, their hearts are already in the right place. If someone is coming, if a couple's coming up to me and they're, they already know that each other is, is what they are. Cause that, that's the one biggest thing too, is that they, the success of the marriage kind of depends on when the ball is dropped. If the ball is dropped, you know, before the marriage, then there's a higher chance. And this is a, again, according to Dale McGowan, a higher chance that the wedding is going to work out because your cards are already on the table. For me, it happened after, um, for you in your situation, again, because you deconverted after the marriage, you know, you were in a really risky situation where that it, it could go the wrong way. And it seems to have done that for you, which I'm extremely yeah. sorry. It's that's a horrible situation. Um, but yeah, if the cards are already on the table and they're already willing to work together, I mean, I would just say, you know, pick up the book in faith and in doubt, because there's a lot of helpful tips in there on, on, you know, how to mutually respect each other. Um, and not necessarily the belief, but also go and take a look at the tenets of the church and see what you agree with, see what you disagree with. And then if the spouse is also willing to do that, they can look at their, their tenets as well and say, oh, I do agree with this. I don't agree with this because not everyone agrees with the, the tenets of their own church or the doctrine of their own religion. Um, some people don't even read the Bible, right? So some people can say, I'm a Christian, but I've never read the Bible like you know, so it, there's there's people from all different situations, but I mean, just just having that uh, the ability to come up and ask about that, I feel like they're they're in the right they're in the right place. I love I love what you just said about Christians not even reading their own Bible. I think that's that's a big piece of this. Is a lot of times they just don't even know what's in it, and because you you do, I mean, at least from my experience, when you when you are really deconstructing and deconverting you really do start to read these passages with more open eyes. Like, wow, it does encourage, you know, uh, genocide and land theft and child brides and slavery and beating your slaves and stoning people. Like, wow, why didn't I see that before? Or at least why wasn't that an issue before? But it like pops at you. And then you you ask Christians about these and you're like, that's not in the Bible. I'm like, yes, it is. <laughs> like, it's it's crazy how that works. And I, I've often thought in a corollary sense that I think a lot of Christians are ironically uncomfortable defending their own faith, which is weird because you're not supposed to be. You know, the Bible talks about being able to give a reason for the hope that is in you. And uh, certainly being a Berean where you are studying the scriptures uh, to see what what is in them. And, you know, in First Timothy, I think it talks about um, being a, a approved workman who can rightly divide the word of truth. Like you really dive into this book and you know it and you can defend what you believe. And there are certainly people that would would try to defend what they believe. But for a lot of them, they just, it's, it's like, if you just give me a few basics, you know, I know I'm a horrible sinner, but I know God is full of love and he loves me and he saved me through Christ, his death and resurrection. He, he bought me out of the, you know, slave block as it were of sin and of judgment and of punishment. And he brought me into glory. He's like, he's the best dad ever. He's the dad that was like the prodigal son story. He, you know, while I was in the world doing my horrible things and basically shooting myself in the foot, he was waiting for me there with open arms saying, when you're ready, I've got your back. I love you. My home is your home. And it's just, it's a big love fest as, as it were. And then what, but you don't, they can't, they don't think through some of the da more damaging aspects of this book. And when you actually ask them to defend it, they literally cringe trying to defend their own book, which is like, why would you cringe defending your, the book that you're so proud of? But I think that that is a big piece of this. And I, I've noticed that a lot. And I, I've noticed you, when you ask Christians to do it, they they either can't defend it often, or they'll say something like this. And I've heard this response quite a bit. I'm not going to explain it to you because you are not a Christian. You don't have the spirit of God. And these things are spiritually discerned. It's like, you know, it's like trying to um, say, you know, Tim, I'm going to, I'm going to explain something to you, but it's in Chinese. I'm not going to understand that. But if I'd obviously grown up in China, I would, but you know, you have to have that, that inheritance as it were, you have to have that background or it won't make sense. And so they end up finding ways to ignore it is what happens. They just kind of put their, um, what's that bird? I forget. What is it? A peacock? What, what bird puts its head in the sand? <laughs> I, uh, ostrich. Ostrich. Okay. Yeah. So it's like that, like you're just putting your head in the sand, but it puts you in a spot where you're like, I'd, I'd really like to dive into these issues and they really don't want to. Um, yeah. It's very strange. It depends on what your goal is. If you're, if your goal is to try and deconvert someone, um, the only thing that really has seemed to work in the past and I, and I wouldn't advocate for this because again, 
it's it, the only person that can change your mind is you, right? But, uh, but street epistemology seems to be the only way that doesn't cause the backfire effect. I don't know if you're aware of what the back, backfire effect is. No. So the backfire effect causes cognitive dissonance. So what, what it is, is it, it uh, if you give them facts and information, um, they're just going to dig their heels in further into mm-hmm. their own belief. And they're just going to say like, you know, you're just a heathen. What do you know about this? And, and whatever, right? So if you ask them like, why do you believe, why do you believe, um, you know, that Jesus died for your sins? They'll say, well, it says so in the Bible. And then I'll say something like, well, is the Bible a claim or is the Bible the evidence? And then, you know, depending on what the, what information, what, what answer they give, um, you know, it depends on if they say it's the claim and it's like, okay, well, you know, there's other books and the same with the evidence. There's other books from other religions that also say similar stories, but they don't believe in, in the same God or in Jesus as the savior. Um, how do you reconcile that? Right. And then usually they'll say, well, mm-hmm. faith. And then you say, okay, well, what's your definition of faith? And usually they'll come up with something that says like, you know, it's a, um, evidence of things unseen or, you know, whatever it is they quote from the Bible, or sometimes they'll say, well, it's, it's the answer you give when you don't have like concrete evidence, but it's, you know, something, whatever. And then you can say, okay, and this is what Matt Dillahunty always says is, you know, I can say, I can using that, that, um, that uh, definition of faith, I can say that black people are better than white people and take it on faith. And a lot of times they'll go, no, no, you can't do that. And I'll be like, why not? And they'll say, well, because uh, I guess you can, right? It's like, okay, so faith is not a reliable way to get to truth. The book is not a reliable way to get to truth. So what's the reason why you believe in this? And a lot of times they don't have an answer because they think it's the book. They think it's the faith. Sometimes they'll say personal experiences. It's like, okay, but there's other people that have personal experiences that contradict what you're saying. So it literally comes down to, um, and another Dale McGowan quote is, sometimes people, um, their desire to believe trumps their desire to know. And eventually, maybe they'll get to a point where their desire for knowledge out trumps their desire to believe. And that's up to them. It's, I love what those quotes and what you're doing with that. It's, it's, it's the kind of thing too, where you do as a, as an outsider to their thought process, as it were, you have to also just give them that freedom and that bandwidth. Like I've often reminded myself, you know, as if I'm speaking to myself, like Tim, you took you 43 years to escape. Why do they have to escape within one or two years? Mm -hmm. Um, Like, and there's, there's different things that, that cause that dissonance that you're talking about to eventually become such an issue that they're kind of forced to face it as opposed to just, you know, ignoring it. There's so many ways in which if, especially if your whole community is ignoring the cognitive dissonance, it's really easy to just feel like you're okay. You're okay. You've got dozens, maybe even hundreds of people supporting you. Like, no, stay where you're at. You're just fine. And, and it takes, you know, for different people, it might take your best friend deconverting. It might mm-hmm. take a parent deconverting or who knows, or a child. It takes something that shakes you up enough to, to make you think, wait a second, I've been ignoring a critical issue here. Why did I ignore it? And what, what, what do I think about this now? Um, but it's, it is, it, there is that sense of just being patient with people and giving them that bandwidth to say, you're on a different journey than me and your mind works different than me. Your emotions work different than me. The terror theory, like the, the, the terror that you might not see your loved ones after you die. You know, when you go to heaven, you're not going to, they're not there and you're not going to be there. And you're not going to see them. The terror that you've wasted 30, 40 years of your life. And you don't, you've only got part of it left. Like there's a lot of terror involved and you you, you don't know how much this is terrorizing them versus someone else might be more, more matter of fact, like, well, you know, I, it hurts, but I, you know, it, I'd rather have the truth than than a lie. So it is what it is. For someone else, you can't go the the it is what it is route. That is so painful. They have to shut that out. And it's just everybody's different. And being able to say that to yourself, like give them give them bandwidth. They need time to deal with this on their own level. It's just as long as you're able to stand up against the abuses of what they're doing, if they're committing you know spiritual abuses and so forth, psychological abuses. But otherwise, if they just need time, to me, it's like yeah, just. Let, let them do it. And I think too, in our family, and I'd be curious what you would say to this in our family, I've also been very big into just letting them go to anything. Like if, if somebody, if the kids say, Hey, I really want to go to Sunday school. I'm like, Oh, great, great. You know, you'll see your friends and that'll be awesome. As opposed to like, oh, I only want you to go like once a week max. Like, I don't want you to be in church too much. You know, whenever they want to go to something in church, it's like, 
have fun, have a great time. And we'll obviously talk about, I'll, I'll talk later about them with the mythology woven into the Bible, but I won't actually discourage them from being around Christians. And it sounds like you would probably do something similar. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so glad you brought up that, you know, that it took you 43 years. Uh, sorry, is it 43? Yeah. Yeah, it took me 43 years. So, I mean, if you count from birth, which I was pretty much exposed yeah. to Christianity from birth. Yeah, it right. took me 43 yeah. years to escape. So, I mean, you'd be a perfect uh, volunteer for recovering from religion because this is with recovering from religion, we don't try and deconvert anyone. And we realize that everyone's on a journey. And you even said the word journey. So, that's, you know, that's what we think. Um, we're just there to offer hope, healing, and support to those. Uh, dealing with issues that are struggling with issues with regards to non-belief and, um, you know, questioning. Um, and, and, and that's it. We don't deconvert anyone. If anyone is, you know, calling in and they say that they still are a Christian, like I said, we, we push them towards another church that may be a little bit more liberal. Um, but we meet people where they're at and that's the biggest thing. And that's what I try and do in my everyday life to meet people where they're at. You know, I have Muslim friends. I'll actually like grab my chest and say, assalamu alaikum. You know what I mean? That's just, I want to respect them as a person and allow them to be comfortable in their own skin because, oh, my cat's meowing right now. <laughs> if, uh, you know, if you ever want any kind of relationship with somebody, you have to kind of respect them for who they are. And, you know, if it's in their um, wheelhouse to be able to get to the same uh, worldview as you, then that's up to them. Um, and, and I agree. Um, I never put a limit on when my kids can go anywhere or do anything because, um, one of the biggest things when uh, you're talking about raising free thinkers, and I think you should check out the podcast, Dale McGowan's podcast. There's, I think, about 30 episodes, and they're all just incredibly. There's, there's so much information packed into like a 12 minute segment, um, and it all comes from his his book. But the podcast just really puts the play in his voice narrating, and he's got such a such a, a creamy voice too. But um, he uh, he talks about how um, religious literacy is one of the biggest things. So if you, if your kids experience religion, um, it gives them a better understanding of where people are coming from and the culture too, right? Because, um, you know, there's examples where, you know, if someone is struggling with something and they say, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling, whatever, and a friend comes up and goes, oh, have you heard of Jesus before? And they go, no. They go, oh, Jesus is the answer, right? But if someone's heard of Jesus before, they can say, yeah, I've heard of Jesus. And they just kind of move on, right? It's not going to be an answer for them because they've already experienced that. Another thing, too, is that you're kind of um, taking away the luster. So if you let them go to Sunday school or or whatever, um, they're not going to see this church as a magical place where people go in and they're like healed or whatever, right? So the kids are going to be like, ooh, ah, what's in that building, right? But if they've already been there and they know, okay, it's just a bunch of stuff where we do crafts and learn boring, boring stories, then, you know, what's the harm? Yeah. What, I'm just curious when you all do talk with your kids, like, where do you think they're at with this? And what, like, what are some of their questions and do they ever make comments about it being interesting having parents that have divergent beliefs? And did you ever get the sense that they wish you all were completely on the same page on some of these things? Like just how those conversations go. Mostly it's normal for them because it's been since they've been born. Right. So they, they've always had that. Um, it's it's cool because like neither of us have ever stopped each other from taking them places or doing things um and like we'll be we'll be going somewhere and then my kids will be like what's that and i'll be like oh that's a turban and that person's a sikh and this is what they believe and you know um they're just so curious genuinely curious about things and curiosity is another one of the best practices like encouraging curiosity um we also we, we've taken them to help out um, feed the homeless at a place called Street Help in Windsor here. They've actually like handed food out the window. They've made the meals and handed it out. They've also handed out like clothing and stuff too. So like my six-year-old will stick his head out the window and go, do you need a sleeping bag? <laughs> like to someone walking by and they'll be like, oh yes, I do. And he'll go and get the sleeping bag and hand it to them and say, you know, happy new year. Stuff like that. It's just, you know, encouraging awesome. that empathy, encouraging compassion. Um, and um getting back to the original thing that you asked there about um, if they ever feel any kind of, or where they're at. Um, my youngest one always says that he believes in God, but he's really funny because he'll be like, I believe in God. And I'll be like, oh yeah. And he's like, yeah. And then he goes, um, because God made us. And I said, oh, okay. Who made God? He goes, hmm, you're right, dad. There's no God. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, okay. You know, you can still keep thinking about it. You don't need to come to a conclusion right now. And that's the, the yeah. cool thing too. Like even for myself, like, I mean, if there's information out there that shows me that there's another worldview that's, that trumps atheism, humanism, like 
I'm willing to change my mind. You know, it's just, I haven't been convinced of anything. Um, but my kids are open and, um, you know, the oldest one, like Nathan, he, um, he always tells me all the time that, that he doesn't believe, but he said that he, he, it's hard for him to fit in at Sunday school because he doesn't believe and the other kids do believe. And I said to him, well, you know, maybe the other kids don't believe either. You know, have you ever thought of that? Or, you know, maybe, you know, you know, it's, there's, there's, you know, so many things that you can say. Um, I try and just be empathetic, listen to them, offer in my two cents, but I don't push them in one direction or the other. Um, I try and just have open dialogue with them. I've never treated them like they're, they're babies. I always talk to them like, like human beings and, you know, this, this stuff is important, um, but it's it's not anything that they need to decide or anything right now. And it's something that, you know, they may never decide. It might be just an open ended question. And that's totally fine, too. They yeah. they know that they can question anything. They know that they can say, I don't know. And it's a totally reasonable answer. Hmm. Um, just since you did say you're an open book, uh, just going back to your marriage for maybe one or two last questions. Now move on to um, another topic. But does it does it break your heart at all that you all can't really talk about some of these topics openly? And I'm, I'm sure it's, it'd be a, a dream and a goal to be able to talk more freely, but is it hard to have topics where you're just like, it's going to be too, whatever, too offensive or too difficult to weave through this. So let's just save it for another day. Like how do you emotionally process having a whole, whole set of things that are not just important topics, but they're really important to you, but they have to stay as it were in the closet. Yeah, I and that's one of the things when I when I said that I do the presentation and I come up with the uh, I ask a question to my to my wife like what is it that's positives and negatives to uh, our relationship and one of my negatives is like there's things that I want to share with her all the time that I feel is super interesting but I'm like this is gonna this is gonna raise her hackles and I don't want to do that um, you know like Tim Minchin's song like thank you God I want her to listen to that song because it's just so hilarious you know like thank you God for fixing the cataracts of Sam's mom like makes me laugh every time i just think it's so hilarious um so it's like i i i feel sad that i can't share some of the things that are that are i find funny and and important and and like you said it's this is a big part of my life right now because this is a huge i don't know if it's a hobby of mine but it just i'm super interested in religion and um non-religion um and humanism that's just a huge thing in my life right now so it's like it's it's difficult but at the same time she hears all the stuff that i do and she's like i'm torn because i want to come and listen to it but i'm also scared and that type of thing right and she and she doesn't like being the center of attention so it's like i'm drawing all this attention to her and she <laughs> and she doesn't like that you know she was she's a very private person um so like i the one presentation i have coming up um at sunday assembly detroit because detroit's just across the bridge from me um amazing place i don't know if you've heard of sunday assembly yeah um, mm -hmm. okay so, so you know, the, the background of how they got started for i don't i've been a couple times to the one here in atlanta but I'd, I'd yeah feel free to fill us in yeah so it started by two comedians going through the uk and i believe they were british and they were just saying like oh we we wish we could have some kind of church but no religion and they're like wait a minute let's do that <laughs> so so they created this uh like sunday assembly where they get together on a, sun, a sunday have motivational speeches they share a meal um you know they have a kids program where they learn science and they do you know read cool books and stuff like that um yeah so i got really involved with them because the ones here are very active and they have like 40 50 60 people show up on a sunday and the whole family's come cindy's come with me to to sunday assembly and she loves it she gets along with the people we've done the kids program together like we've actually run the kids program at one point um and she just gets involved that way like she's just very open to it and like i have no problem now that she knows that i'm a non-believer i have no problem going to the church once in a while my son nathan was in the uh, christmas play and we all went my my mother-in-law knows that i'm not religious i went behind the scenes to talk to him to prep him up to get to go on stage as the shepherd and stuff like that so it's a lot of like the whole family is in a really good place where we are all like open to each other's uh, situation. Mm, that's awesome. I love it. I love, I love hearing success stories. It really does do my heart a lot of good. And it's, it's so cool that it seems like too, like if, if either one of you ever changed in the future and I'm just making the assumption that it would, it would most likely be that if she felt like she was exiting uh, a religious worldview, but just the idea that it, it isn't like a, 
ha ha, I told you so. You were an idiot this whole time. Like that whole like ost- or um just being a jerk about it is just not not on the equation. It's not there now. It's not going to be there later. Like this is just you take your journey. I'll respect you as much as I can. I'll take my journey, and we'll just love each other through it. And yeah. that's that's so cool that you know there's there's that freedom, um, but also just that sense of like if you know if 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 we get there, we get to that ideal spot. I know it's not ideal for the sake of your interfaith presentation, but if we get to that ideal spot where we're more aligned, then it's going to be even even better. Like you know, everybody wants every part of their marriage to be better. You know, we want a better better finances. We want a better home. We want a better you know be more romantic. We want a better intimate life. Like we just want our marriage to in, in, increase in every sense and, and get closer and and more of a blessing to each other and and changing you know merging our our you know or having our beliefs align more would certainly do that but if that doesn't happen we're still going to work in all the other ways that we can and we're still going to make our marriage beautiful and that's just that's so critical because it it kind of feels like oh well we're we can't align on the most important things so we're doomed like no no it's just it's that the doom part of it's gone the punishment part of it's gone like we can we can still love each other and make this unbelievably beautiful with or without every you know we don't have to be clones and so it's 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 so cool i I love i love the way you're the way your story's evolving yeah for sure and and again with the positive negative things both of us when we talked about the positives of our relationship it's being able to see the other side being able to see you know to see through someone else's eyes and and understand where someone else is coming from and then also just having the ability for our kids to have that foundation where they can question they can see two different worldviews and they don't they don't just get stuck into one because regardless even if even if you're in a christian family and both spouses are christian and the kids are christian there's a high chance and i'm talking high where they're going to discover something outside of your faith and they're going to latch onto it so the we're we're in a, a privileged position where we already have the advantage where we're giving our kids all the information up front a lot of these these families where there's a lot of Christian kids, sometimes they'll, they'll rebel against the family because they don't want anything to do with the Christianity and it really breaks all of their hearts. And then there's like a huge blow up about it where, you know, with us, if they become religious or non-religious, we're going to love them no matter what. Nothing's going to change. Mm-hmm. And we've, we've talked about this before, too, with like, you know, if someone changes, I said, you know, if, if I ever become a Christian, I know you're going to be there for me and I know you're going to be there to to help me navigate it. I said the same thing with you. If you ever, you know, lose the religion, I'm going to be there to, you know, help you pick up the pieces. Mm. That's awesome. As it should be, as it should be. Well, uh, I maybe wanted to take us to a, a final topic. That's more about what you do with your, your work and, and your, just your perspectives on life. Uh, humanism. Uh, you are the a chapter ambassador, like we talked about for humanist Canada. Could you maybe start by just describing uh, for someone that's heard the word humanism, but maybe isn't sure exactly how, uh, you know, we would use it. How how does humanism work and why is it so important to you? How would you distinguish that from, you know, like, wh- why would you use humanist versus atheist, you know, primarily? And just in, and maybe merge that into what are you doing for Humanist Canada? Yeah, for sure. That's a lot of information. I'm going to try and uh, <laughs> get it out there. So let's just start with what the difference is between atheism and humanism. So atheism is just a lack of belief in a god. Um, I call myself an agnostic atheist. So Gnosticism has to do with knowledge. So if you're agnostic, you don't have knowledge. If you're Gnostic, you have knowledge. So I consider myself an agnostic atheist where I don't believe that there's any deities or gods or or supernatural things, but I'm not sure 100% because I don't feel like you can be 100% sure on anything. Um, When it comes to humanism, humanism is a uh, non-religious philosophical worldview that puts the highest emphasis on like human uh, well-being, human dignity, um, mutual respect, reason, scientific research, um, that type of thing. And, you know, there's there's the the seven fundamentals of of humanism, which are basically on the, that uh, that plane. So like ethics and stuff like that. Right. And, and we always talk about this, that like if any of those fundamentals need to change because they're not going towards the betterment of society, they're going to change. It's not like doctrine where we have to, you know, maintain, you know, anti-LGBTQ just because the doctrine says so. Um, we're the opposite, right? So like if if, if we're doing something that, that seems like it's it's a, to, you know, not to the betterment of society, then we're definitely going to change it. Um, when it comes to our group down here, um, the history of this group, uh, so when I moved to Windsor, um, and I was going through my angry atheist phase, 
Um, I started an atheist group where we were just sharing memes and stuff like that and kind of being goofy about it. Um, and then eventually um, I heard the term humanist and I really liked that because I was trying to find something that I can identify with that's going to show people that I'm still a good person, even though I don't believe in a God. Because that was, you know, the thing down here, especially, it was like people come up to you, well, what church do you belong to? Or, you know, that type of thing. Um, so they just assume that you go to church or they assume that, you know, because I'm a nice person that I must be religious. Um, so we created the Ambassador Humanist Association because we have Ambassador Bridge right here. So we thought that's kind of a neat name. Um, and we were doing some some cool stuff. So we were like helping out with the homeless and doing all that. And um, I went to Baja Con, which is the in Sarnia, they have the Blue Water Atheists, Humanists and Agnostics. And then they had a convention where they had a bunch of speakers come and, and all that. So um, the representatives from Humanist Canada there were the president, Martin Frith, and the executive director, Betty Ann Hedges. And they both approached me. And they're like, we really like what you're doing down in Windsor with that Ambassador Humanist Association. Would you mind like changing the name to Humanist Canada Windsor chapter? We're thinking about doing these chapters. And maybe you could be the chapter ambassadors to help people you know, open up new chapters. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds awesome to me. So we we rebranded. Um, and, and part of the whole thing is, is that Humanist Canada kind of wants to have an umbrella over the whole country so that we can kind of be united under one name. Um, and that way we can, we can, because we call it human or Humanist Canada, like their motto is, um, you know, the, uh, the national voice for secularism. So secularism is just non-religion, right? Like secular just means non-religious. Um, so we want to be that national voice. We want to kind of unite everybody to, um, the humanist thought under one umbrella. So, um, yeah, so we started doing, so once we rebranded, we adopted a street in Windsor and we started picking up garbage there. And it's kind of cool because it kind of encompasses a few different places of worship and reverence from other religions. So there's like a Baptist church there. There's an Islamic center. There's a Jewish center um, just on the street that we have. So we were always there with our shirts that say Humanist Canada, a nonprofit organization. And then, uh, you know, people ask, oh, what church do you belong to? Well, we don't belong to a church. We're, we're humanists. Oh, what's that? And we explain to them. Uh, and they're like, oh, I really like that. I really like that. Uh, even my mother-in-law, you know, when she heard humanists, she's like, oh, like, what is that? And I explained to her, she's like, I, I love that. I think it's just a great thing. Um, and so we we helped out feed the homeless again at Street Help. Um, and the cool thing is, too, is the, the, um, the chief administrator at Street Help, she's a, a lifelong humanist Canada member, but she's Christian. So you don't necessarily have to be an atheist to be a humanist. It's just whether or not you place your highest value on the things that we value, as opposed to like a supernatural deity. Um, but it's funny because she's had ministers and priests and all that come there and volunteer. And then when they, if they try and do a prayer, like say, oh, you have to do a prayer before you get a meal. She goes, no, get out. <laughs> you know, so she's, she's valuing that human dignity as, as one of her highest values before, before the religion. That's awesome. I've, I've, I've talked a few times about how I, I used to be a, a bit of a street preacher in Philadelphia where I'm from, and we we definitely did that other negative side of it. I, I used to do a lot of preaching in, in soup kitchens. And of course, you know, you've got the captive audience because they know that they can't get their soup and bread until after they've heard you, you know, do your 30, 40 minutes of, uh, of preaching. And I, I did that for quite a long time. But mm. uh and they're probably just like, get on with it, get on with it, get us the food, right? <laughs> yeah, we've heard this all before. And they probably, they probably yeah. have. I mean, because, you know, you're thinking they're homeless people. So they're possibly in some really dire straits medically and otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, nutritional wise. So they might not have that long to live. Like you're really concerned. And so their souls are, are first and foremost. So probably every preacher that comes in is like focused on the gospel. It's not like we're going to, you know, do an exposition of the book of, you know, Esther or something like we're going to, we're going to get you saved. Because your your life is probably not going to be as long as as we'd love it to be, but yeah, I, I definitely obviously regret those days <laughs> significantly. But that's but you awesome. Know, you, should, you shouldn't regret it because it was a part of your history and it's a part of who you are. And you were doing it from a good place. You were doing it from the kindness of your heart because um, you thought it was the right thing. So yeah, in a sense, never be down on yourself for that, right? You 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 thought that you were doing it from a good place. Yeah, I would I would say when I was a teenager. And, you know, yep, preteen and a teenager, I definitely would give myself that grace. By the time I became an adult, you know, you, you, we all kind of see that age of, of like, you're responsible now. You're responsible for what your face looks like. Or, you know, you're always, always, you know, grimacing or you're always, you know, having a frown on your face or you're smiling. You're responsible for your face, you know, at a certain point. You're responsible for what you do with your life. And I, th I think by the time I became a, an adult, I think I see it as like, yeah, I, I did mean well. 
but also, you know, it's kind of like, kind of like I've used this illustration before. It's not exactly a one for one, but if you grew up in a white supremacist group and, you know, as a young teenager, you're just exposed to it. That's like, you're kind of going to white supremacist churches and groups hanging out only with people that, you know, have that worldview at a certain point. A certain point though you kind of grow where you're like you're responsible you know especially when you get to the point where you could actually have get married and have children and pass it on like you're responsible for this and it's ironic that it's it's the kids part of it i know you probably don't know my story but my kids were the actual first main reason that i thought through my worldview because mm-hmm. i was thinking through do i want to pass this on to them or not and right. we, were, we were singing a song about uh, joshua fought the battle of jericho which is about the the land theft of canaan and then the uh you know the genocide Yep. And it was like, that was what prompted me. Like I, I was singing that song with the kids and I suddenly was like, I can't, I can't sing this song with them anymore. Why can't I? And I was like cringing inside, like, what do I do with this? I feel, I feel very, very embarrassed at myself that I'm teaching them this, but yet I have to, this is part of the word of God. But it's interesting yeah. how, you know, kids, even if you don't force yourself to think through your worldview as a young adult, maybe at age 20 or 25, when your kids come, hopefully you, you think through at least the question of, is this really a worldview I should be passing on? Right. Yeah. And, and I, and I totally appreciate where you're coming from on that. Um, I do feel like p- people are victims of bad ideas too. So, yeah. I mean, even if you're an adult who never had a chance, I feel like you're still a victim of, of that bad idea. Um, there's a really good book and I know you're having him as a guest soon. Uh, Dr. Daryl Ray, the God virus. It's a really good book that kind of, you know, uses it as an analogy to compare, um, religion as kind of a virus that gets passed on to the next generation and stuff like that. And they use vectors like ministers, priests, things like that, which is, you know, part of the reason why they want to protect priests instead of firing them when they do crazy things, um, because they put a lot of time and dedication into, you know, creating this vector that's going to pass this information on. So they want to make sure they protect those, those vectors. Um, It's a really good, really good book talks about even when you, when you have conversations with people, Um, so this is one of the examples from the book, but he basically says, if you're on a plane and you see someone wearing a cross or they're reading the Bible or something, you can just talk to them normally say like, oh, you know, how about them cowboys or whatever, right? And just talk to them about a normal, a thing. And then all of a sudden say, oh, I noticed you're wearing a cross. You know, can you tell me a little bit about your faith? And all of a sudden you'll notice that their body language changes. And it's almost like invasion of the body snatchers where they kind of get this like twisted smile and like, oh yeah, Jesus is this, that, and the other, right? And it's like, then say, oh, excuse me, I'm just going to go to the washroom and you come back and you say like, oh, okay, what about, um, you know, where are you going and all this stuff? And then notice how their body language changes back to like the person that they actually are. So it's like he was, he's saying like, don't address the God virus, you know, don't talk to them about the religion, just talk to them like a normal human being and you might be able to get more out of the conversation. Um, and if they bring the religion into it, Instead of addressing the religion, if you want to, if you don't want to go down that route, route, you can just, you know, bring it back to something else. Like if someone says, like, God bless you, I'll say, oh, thank you very much, because I take it as a as a as a compliment. Um, I, I get that all the time. Actually, we had some hate mail because we went on uh, the radio um, before Christmas and then also yesterday. But before Christmas, we were on the radio um, to talk about Humanist Canada, Windsor chapter in, in the local area. And we just talked about um you know what we're doing to help and things like that and then we ended up getting an email from someone that said uh um you're leading everyone to hell and you would be better it would be better if you had gone off the end of the incomplete gordy howe bridge which is just a bridge that they're finishing right now to get between canada and the us and um so instead of you know writing back like oh you know that's hateful and blah 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 i just went thank you for your concern um, I understand that it seems, you know, a lot of people are afraid of hell. I don't believe in hell. And if you want to discuss it, we can have coffee and and discuss it. And I never heard back from them. But when I got on the radio yesterday, we told that story. I even said on the radio, I said, if you're listening, reach out to me. Let's go have a coffee and talk about it. That's awesome. I love it. I, I, I love hell. I know, I know David Ames talks about this a lot, but just the idea of secular grace. We can, we can in some ways be more loving and gracious than uh, Christians and even the, or than ourselves when we were Christians. And it's, it's amazing. It's such a cool testimony to use a Christian word, it's such a cool testimony to the fact that, you know, the, the, the goodness in us was not from a religion. The goodness was already there. I mean, it, it's, you, you deconvert, you're still just as good in some ways. You might be even better. Yeah. And David C. Smalley, I'm not sure if you're aware of him, um, but I don't think he, so. has a, 
he has this really cool analogy when he talks about if someone's dying in the desert and they're crawling towards a water source and you know they're going to die, if you give them a Coca-Cola, they're going to survive. But what's in the Coca-Cola? It's sugar, syrup, all that stuff, right? So that's the religion. You pull out the syrup, you pull out the sugar. What they really need is the water that's underneath. And we always say that's what humanism is, mm. is the water underneath. I love too how even though humanism is focused obviously on the word human, often humanism humanists end up advocating a lot for for um, you know being being kind to animals too, which is obviously we're you know part of the animal kingdom. So it's really cool how that that transcends both humans and animals. Yeah, absolutely. Could I ask maybe to wrap us up? I would love to hear your advice to someone like me. What would you advise to someone who's in a more militant uh, religious? interfaith marriage. Um, and I, I don't ask that because I per se um, have bandwidth at this point for for what I'm going to do. My, my path is already kind of set. And unfortunately, it did it did end up in a, in, a, in a dissolution. But just in general, for 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 people like me, where it is it is very, very much like if you do this, if you deconvert, um, you will have hell to pay, not just in the afterlife, but right now you'll have hell to pay for it. What would you say to people like that? in terms of just like whatever stream of consciousness, whatever comes to mind as to both how to process it in short term. And, and we know what, when the deconversion first starts, when you first kind of put out your cards and also long-term. Yeah. So I'm first going to say, I'm extremely sorry for that situation and not just because I'm a Canadian and I have to say sorry, but I'm actually genuinely sorry um, that you, that you had to go through that situation. And, and I want you to know that you tried your hardest to, to do what you thought was best because I always, I, I even said to my wife at one point, do you want me to pretend to be something I'm not, or do you want me to be me? And she had to think about it, but in the end, she said she wanted me to be me. Right. So mm -hmm. you're in a different situation where she would have probably preferred if you pretended, but then you would have felt like a wolf in sheep's clothing and you need to be who you are because people can only take so much right? You can't just pretend to be something you're not for your whole life. And then on your deathbed, just be like, I really wish I lived my life to the fullest. Um, I think the main focus right now, um, and like I said, I'm not a professional, right? <laughs> but um, I think your main focus right now would be your kids. Um, because I mean, your, your, your marriage at this point, I'm not sure if it could be saved. I mean, it seems like you're, you're already at the point now where you don't think it probably could be. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you can, like you said, give give her the space and, and that type of thing. And then, you know, maybe she would come around, but it seems like the decision's already kind of made. So I would just focus on your your kids um, and then you can you can maybe through them um, with through that shared, you know, the co-parenting, get to a point with your wife um, where you at least have a mutual understanding of how you want to raise the kids and how you want to. Um, still continue that extended family, even though you may be not together at the time. It also give you an opportunity to meet somebody else, potentially give her the opportunity to meet somebody else. And then maybe they will through those other people and through you through the other person might be able to, um, you know, kind of understand the, the other person better. Um, I would suggest if you haven't already getting Dale McGowan's books on parenting beyond belief and raising free thinkers, um, and listening to the podcast, the podcast definitely helped me. And I would say Dale McGowan is my humanist hero. He did save my marriage. I, I wrote a column on the humanist.com for Dale. Um, and, and I sent it to him. He, he, he appreciated it, but yeah, he, he actually is a really good friend and just, you know, my, my hero for, for doing that. So I feel like hopefully you can get some information from him that, that I did as well, that might work for your situation. Um, but again, I'm, I'm extremely sorry. I, I, I wish I could do something to help you. Um, but, uh, that's pretty yeah. much all. I've got. Well, thank you for saying that. Yeah. It's the one, the one good thing about it, if, if you can call it good is I feel like there were a lot of people that came into my rate on my radar very quickly. They were going through something similar. And I realized if I hadn't gone through some of the more painful parts of this, as some of us do, um, something not everybody does, but some of us do. I, I don't think I would have been able to understand the pain as much and, and everything from the unequally yoked, as they like to say, that, that side of it from the, the, the philosophical differences to what quickly became a, a, a touchless marriage. To, you know, there was a, there's people that have touchless marriages for 
many reasons, you know, religious or not, but just the, the some of the pain, most painful parts of this got on my radar very quickly. And I realized I can empathize with a lot of people's pain in ways that I wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And so if there is a, a, a you know, shining thread to this, I would say it's the, definitely the sympathy and the empathy has risen exponentially in my heart, which I'm, I'm glad about. I'm glad that I can relate to people and, and I can definitely feel the pain with people and just say, I'm like, you're saying, you're sorry for my situation. I'm also, you know, I've extended that to other people. And it's, I think just knowing that you're not alone, that there's people that care and that there's pe- some people, unfortunately going through it as well, but either way, there's people that care about us and there's people that say, you know, you're, you're doing your best. And it's just because, you know, this, the situation did or didn't work out doesn't mean you can't still have a beautiful life. And the, the, this is just one chapter and there's more chapters to be written, you know? So, yeah. And you got four beautiful children that you need to you know, be there for and everything. Right. So, yeah, uh, exactly. I can, I can only see things going more positively, you know, in the future. Um, but I, I'm not a mind reader and I'm not a, a fortune teller, but um, yeah. I would also bring this up to Dr. Ray, Daryl Ray, when you have him on um, and, and reach out to recovering from religion, just uh, recovering from religion.org. You can go on there, give them a call or send them, a, you can chat with them. You might end up speaking to me on the other end. Sometimes I answer the, the calls and the chat still, but yeah. yeah. I, I actually yeah. did just to give them a plug. I did actually call right at the beginning of my deconversion. I oh. didn't think I would. I didn't think it would be very necessary. And I, I I know some people probably call a lot. I called twice and just, it was like a two hour conversation the first time, maybe an hour the second time. And I felt at that point, like I, I was, I was okay. I was stable enough, but I got the sense that it's definitely a place where if you were needing, you know, repeat conversations, repeat help, yeah. that they're wide open to whatever you need. And like yeah. you said, there's no pressure. Like they're not saying, yeah, you should stay deconverted or you should go back. Like just they're, they're, they're more a sounding board, which is so helpful just to have someone be willing to listen to your whole story and just kind of give you respectful two cents without giving you solid advice and saying you should really should do this or that. Like they leave at the end of the conversation, they leave you with like, do what's do what's best for you. Yeah, they try and help you come up with your own plan. Um, and then that way you can create create your own goals and kind of take the next step. And then yeah. they're there for you to fall back on if you need to as well. They have tons of resources as well. Their whole resource section, you can type in keywords and it'll bring up things. A lot of Dale McGowan stuff is on there. Um, Street yeah. Cosmology stuff, everything, all that stuff is, you know, there's a whole section and the, the resources for maintaining relationships with believers and that type of thing. Um, there's also on Monday nights, they have RFRX talks where they have like a guest speaker come in, speak for about an hour. And there's a question and answer period. Um, they have an online community, which is basically if you feel like you need continued support, you can belong to this like internal community, which is basically by invite only um, and continue just going through the healing process there. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, lots of ways to stay anonymous if you need to as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And their information will never will never get leaked or anything. So, yeah. um, do you know who it was that you spoke to when you called? I don't. It's been, it's been a while. It's been about four years. But um, I do remember I was calling at odd hours just because I was I was trying to stand under the radar at that point. I didn't stand under the radar very long. I, I came I came out you know pretty strong and bold pretty quickly. But the first month or two I was kind of under the radar, and I was calling at weird hours. So I got routed to like I think the UK the first time or Australia and then the UK. But it was it, they're good good people. They, they definitely yeah, were definitely. If it was Australia, I know who it is, and he's an amazing person. Yeah, so. yeah. If he's if he if it's the same person, and he remembers me. I don't know how many calls a day. I'm sure, it's hard to remember everybody, but if he if he remembers me, I definitely appreciate sure, the uh, sure early he conversation. He's got, a, he's got a pretty good photographic memory, or I guess whatever oral memory. I don't know what you call it if it's through the the phone. But yeah, no, he's he's one of our our best volunteers. So. Mm, that's awesome. Well, I I really appreciate your time today. This has been great to hear your story and to hear about. Uh, both your 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 journey as well as your family as well as the work with Humanist Canada, uh, just I love it. Uh, did I, I know I asked you a lot of questions, but before we wrap up, did you have any other uh, thoughts you wanted to add? So not too much, but uh, if anyone is in the uh, Ohio area um, in March, I'm going to be um, doing my interfaith family presentation at the uh, Cleveland Humanist Alliance, which is part of the American Humanist Association. Um, and that's going to be on March 24th at 2.30 uh, at the Independence Library. Very nice. And uh, also, I was going to say, speaking of Canada, I'll be up in Baja Khan in August. So if you happen to be in the neck of the woods at that time, feel free to drop by. Yeah, it should be there. Um, and that's probably about an hour and a half from my house. So maybe oh, nice. I'll have you over after and you can come hang out. That's awesome. Yeah, that's. I've, I've been to Canada a few times, but I haven't been to that part of it. So I'm looking forward to uh, to visiting. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm planning to come to Atlanta at some point to see Dale. So hopefully we can 
get together. Yeah. How close are you to Atlanta? I'm um, just like 20 minutes north, so real close. Okay, awesome. So yeah, hopefully we can we can all get together or something. That'd be really yeah, cool. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Well, let me let me give your name one last shot here as we wrap up. See if I get it right. Um, we've been speaking with Steve Chicatis. Is that closer? All, all the way closer, or yeah, that's it. it. Okay, <laughs> awesome. We've been speaking <laughs> with Steve Chicatis. Uh, that's that's that is an interesting name. Um, I, I think I could easily like if we waited a week and did another interview, I could still get your name wrong. That's just that's that's a different name. So, uh, yeah. but <laughs> thank you so much, Steve. Great to hear your uh, story. Great to get to know you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your example of being a you know loving spouse to to a Christian. Um, great, great to hear your example and the, what you're doing with your with your kids. Just blows me away. Again, I love these success stories. So thank you for what you're doing and thank you for what you're doing for Humanist Canada. And uh, thank you for your time today. Yeah, thank you so much. Um... I hope uh, maybe in the future we can do this again. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I always, I love to, uh, love to do follow-ups. I haven't done too many yet, but I always invite people. I always think, I, I think of the first one is like, let's tell you your story. And then the second one, let's hear what just like topics that are on your heart and you just need a platform to kind of, you know, express some of, some of those uh, great ideas that, you know, kind of foment for a while and then they get clarified. It's like, it's time to, time to let the world know there's some really good ideas out there. So I definitely would love to do it again. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much. We'll see you Thank, later. Thanks, Steve. Bye.